All right, let's get started. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to our next round of uh, fellowship presentations. Um, for, up first is, uh, I'm sorry if I butcher your name, <laughs> uh, Jajit, you're up first. Yes. Okay. So uh, shall I share my presentation from the PDF or, or just- Either uh, way, that's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with, just go ahead and, you can go ahead and share. Okay, sure. Give me a second. I hope you can see my screen. Yep, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jaji Chakraborty. I am currently a senior year student at National Institute of Technology, Durgapur in India. So this summer, I worked as an IDSF fellow on the project, making Skyhook DM experiments reproducible and scalable with Popper. So my mentors were Carlos Marzan, Ivo Gimenez, and Jeff Leafever from UC Santa Cruz. So let's start with looking at a generic systems experimentation workflow. So it consists of steps like booting infrastructure in form of VMs or bare metal nodes, building, deploying, building and deploying the software and running experiments. This, uh, this step goes on iteratively, then downloading the results, preparing plots and notebooks. But uh, if all these steps are done manually, these are highly time consuming and error prone. For our use case for Skyhook DM, a generic explanation workflow looks, looks similar to this. We, we, we experiment Skyhook DM on Kubernetes since Kubernetes provides the tool called Rook that makes de deploying storage systems on Kubernetes self-managing, self-healing, and takes care of the entire orchestration of the, uh, of the storage system. So uh, for this, we need to first boot up, uh, boot up a Kubernetes cluster, then baseline the cluster. Since it is a, since it is a storage system experiment, uh, the important ones are network and disk performance. Then we deploy a vanilla version of Ceph and measure the throughput of Ceph on that particular cluster or, or on that particular infrastructure. We can also, we also deploy a monitoring infrastructure for, a, for our use case, we use Prometheus and Grafana since it provides nice visualizations. Then finally, we upgrade the Ceph cluster to a Skyhook DM cluster and benchmark it by running queries on several hundred gigabytes of tabular data. So, and then we download the results, plot notebooks, uh, study the Grafana dashboard snapshots, etc. So how this helps us is uh, we first benchmark the underlying infrastructure and then, uh, and then we deploy Ceph and see how much overhead it provides over the, over the underlying cluster. And then we again, and then we deploy Skyhook to, to find out how much overhead the Skyhook processing libraries has over vanilla Ceph. But doing this it requires, uh, doing this manually requires installing a lot of tools like FIO, iperf, uh, using Ceph deploy and, uh, and kubectl from the user side. So, but these can lead to a lot of dependency management problems and uh, can make the experiment non-reproducible basically. Because uh, for Jupyter notebooks, we, we need to set up a Jupyter environment using Python and if some of the Python versions go wrong, then the experiment will be uh, irreproducible. So to make that reproducible, uh, to, to solve this dependency management problem and, and, and prevent installing all the tools required by ourselves, we can use containers or container images. Okay, so basically uh, running, running, running the tools manually looks something like this. You need to SSH into the nodes manually and then run the tools one by one properly with the proper flags and the proper arguments, parameters, et cetera. Any one thing goes wrong, and they, either the results come wrong or become septic. 
Okay, so com coming back, so uh, we can use containers to solve the dependency management problem. So let's see our overview of containers. So containers are an OS level virtual virtualization technology that wraps an application along with the dependencies, binaries, libraries, etc., and makes them portable. Containers basically increase efficiency while while running applications in an isolated manner, and and has less resource footprint than that of virtual machines. So, so to solve the dependency management problem, we can what we can do is containerize the scripts and tools or the commands and then run them. So that way you prevent installing all the tools by yourself and just uh, download a Docker image and run the and run the scripts or commands inside it. But still, you, uh, as we can see, the, although this is fairly minimal, with with lots of parameters for experiment, there can be it can it can become cumbersome because or because of lots of flags to be provided correctly, and and this becomes difficult to manage. Even if even if you put it, them in a readme, that can become up, uh, outdated very quickly, and does not help much. So there it still lacks a lot of automation, and an user would end up likely running hundreds of Docker run commands. So to augment it with automation, we can use Popper. So Popper, sorry. So uh, as container abstract operating systems, Popper abstracts on containers. Popper abstracts containerization con 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 containers like Docker, uh, Singularity, Podman for different use cases and environments, and also CI tools like Travis, Jenkins, Circle and allows running workflows in an con 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 container uh, in a container engine agnostic manner so how does it look so with popper you can define a workflow in the form of a in a in a lightweight yaml format which basically consists of steps where each step is uh, nothing but the image to be used the docker image to be used and the commands that needs to be done within the docker image so if you define uh, if you define a workflow in the for in 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 this format, uh, Popper takes it and 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 runs correctly in the order that you have specified, and thus you and thus you can reduce your work from running uh, all those hundreds of Docker run commands to a single Popper run command, and this uh, Popper workflow file can be sh shared easily with using version version control. So using Popper for automating our SkyVDM experiments looks something like this. So we take all the guides and documentation that like the guides for building, uh, deploying, running, running queries, running benchmarks, and we convert them into a couple of Popper workflows. So uh, uh, someone starting with SkyVDM or safe experimentation can skip going over uh, the huge number of documentation or the guides provided and they can simply clone the repository clone clone our workflows repository and install popper and run all the and run and run the workflows uh, step by step one after another and running these six or seven workflows can help uh, helps you to reproduce and experiment totally So some implementation highlights from, from our workflows. So the workflows are made highly configurable and scalable with parameter sweeps. So you can provide number of different uh, number of different parameters through environment variables. And 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 proper and, and the workflows will run the experiments one by one using those parameters. Also, you can if if you uh, also for running queries, for example, you can first run the queries in a small scale manner with suppose 10 or 100 objects and then if you want you can specify the number of objects to 10000 or 1 lakh and run queries over a billion or over a billion rows so it it, it seems you can seamlessly scale up your workflows or your experiments so also the, we provide workflows for automatically deploying monitoring infrastructure using prometheus and grafana and 
since these workflows are basically built for experimenting with Skyhook DM or Ceph inside a Kubernetes environment, we try to reuse as much as tools from the Kubernetes ecosystem. So uh, Rook, uh, QSpray, which is a tool for deploying or for, for automatically deploying a Kubernetes cluster on a on a set of VMs or nodes. Uh, Kubestone, which is a benchmarking operator for Kubernetes. Uh, Kube Prometheus that uh, that provides operators for deploying Prometheus, etc. So we have so we build workflows for a, every high level step that that can go in a safe experimentation pipeline. So from from booting up nodes on 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 Cloud Lab or sorry from booting up from booting up nodes on Cloud Lab to deploying Skyhook and till running experiments and plotting the results, we have workflows we build workflows for all of them. So the the benchmark or experiment workflows follow a structure similar to the one shown on the right here. Uh, we have a bootstrap config step that bootstraps the configuration files for the pods depending upon the environment variables that are provided through the workflow. Then the start step deploys the pods from the, using those config files. Then the copy config step uh, basically copies the Ceph config that was downloaded to the local machine while deploying the Ceph cluster to the client pod so that the client pod could connect to the rest of the cluster. Then the run benchmark step uh, executes the benchmark commands or scripts inside the client pods and the plot, then the plot results step download the results uh, runs Jupyter notebooks, uh, generates plots, and tear down, tear, tears down all the resources that are spawned by the workflow, like the pods or any volumes, etc. So, the yeah, the workflows provide uh, the, the workflows generate plots like this, and this is a snapshot of a Grafana dashboard from running our workflow during this, uh, for, for, from running our workflow on, on benchmarking a Skyhook DM deployment on the reward SSL cluster. So these are some of the artifacts. And we have Jupyter notebooks for this. So this Jupyter notebooks gets executed and the plots gets generated within that, all, all through the workflows. So a small case, case study. We benchmarked Skyhook DM um, on, the, on, on the U Chicago reward SSL cluster. So we got really good results on, on, on pushing down the, on pushing down operations to the storage layer. And also uh, as we scaled out, we discovered bottlenecks in network IO for 10 gigabyte links. Uh, also we discovered some an unbalanced CPU usage in OSDs uh, due, to, due, to due to presence of some unbalanced placement groups. So basically this helps to speed up your research uh, speed and you can get new avenues for further investigation quickly and iterate quickly. Uh, as a future work, we strive to extend this set of workflows to cover to to build workflows for benchmarking other safe components, like other safe components like the file system, the Redos block device, etc. Also, this idea of making making systems experimentations reproducible and automated and containerized can be applied to other systems also like popular ones on like key value stores and databases which are few frequently used in research thank you uh, please visit you can visit my work at this link and please let me know if you have any questions thank you uh, thank you to Shaji. uh does anyone have any questions Uh, which version of uh, Ceph did you use? Okay, yeah. So for our, for our experiments, we use the Ceph Nautilus version. Okay, right. Yeah. Really interesting work. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Thank you for your presentation. It was uh, looks like a, a lot of interesting work, and uh, I think you did well underneath the uh, considering the circumstances. So thank you. Thanks. That was Up a next. really nice experience. All right. Now, uh, on next is uh, next up is Alan. Alan, are you ready to go? Yeah. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Okay.
So, um, hello everyone, my name is Alan. I'm a second year computer science undergrad student at the University of Cincinnati. And the topic of my research is um, investigating a matrix factorization based algorithm for PV finding. So before the fellowship started, I had some basic exposure to uh, machine learning concepts, at, but I didn't have too much exposure to high energy physics concepts. So please forgive me if I make any uh, mistakes in my explanations. So in experiments done at the LHCB, um, most all, all experiments pro produce data in the form of three dimensional hits. So for scientists to be able to do further analysis of this experimental data, you first need to reconstruct tracks from these um, hits data and then you need to be able to figure out at what points of origin do all these tracks come from and these points of origin are called as primary vertices or pvs in short so already there are a bunch of existing clustering algorithms which aim to do this pv finding step so one such example which does it for the lhcb is uh, described in the paper by uh, kujarzik and co this 2014 paper so in this um, research, we aim to um, try to find other matrix factorization based um, alternatives for other existing clustering algorithms. So first, what is matrix factorization? So matrix factorization is essentially <laughs> taking an input matrix and factoring it into a bunch of um, smaller matrices. So you want to multiply these smaller factor matrices and you want to get a resultant matrix which looks very similar to the um, initial input matrix. And in, in the particular case shown, shown here, we are doing matrix tri-factorization. So instead of two factors, we are basically finding three factors. And also this particular implementation is called as fast NMTF. And actually um, the data matrix shown here, which is X, is actually the distance matrix of, uh, of all tracks from one particular event. So for example, all uh, rows and columns are tracks. So for example, if you just take the first cell here and you choose the value from this uh, particular matrix that shows you the distance between uh, those two tracks and so on. And so the distance metric we are using is something called the ZIP distance. So essentially what we're doing is we are projecting the uh, data from three dimensional space to a lower through a two dimensional space, which we call as RZ space. And we just take the coordinate, which gives you the distance as to um, the distance of that particular point from Z is equal to zero. So you just take this one value, which we call as the ZIP value and the distance matrix just calculates all the absolute distances between all the Z values for all tracks. And this one is actually uh, the inverse of, a tra of the distance matrix. So we just run it through the Gaussian kernel so that it boosts the contrast and inverts all the values. So if you can see this particular matrix, which we call the F matrix, each um, individual blocks you can see here correspond to a certain group of tracks in the initial uh, data matrix. So for example, you can see that there is a clear block which is shown here. And so the block in this particular column of the F matrix corresponds to that. And you can see that each of the blocks in all individual columns here correspond to a particular block here. So the main reason we chose matrix factorization for this is because you can see that in this input matrix, it shows clear distinct block structures, which uh, correspond to in, um, distinct PVs in the actual um, event data. And matrix factorization is a really powerful tool you could use to extract this block structure from an input uh, data matrix. So, other than the first FNMTF implementation we saw earlier, we also um, created our own wrapper implementation, which we call as KRUNS. So this is basically a, a wrapper around the basic FNMTF uh, implementation we saw earlier. So what this does is um, it repeats a series of steps for K number of times, where K is the total number of PVs you want to find from that particular event. So during each step, what you do is you first take the input matrix, you then force FNMTF to find just one cluster. And because of the way FNMTF, FNMTF works, it tries to minimize the reconstruction error. So it basically it takes the two factors it has or the three factors it has, multiplies them together, and it tries to compare how further away that particular reconstructed matrix is from the target input matrix. So that is the reconstruction error. So it tries to, it tries to minimize this reconstruction error. And if you can, and when we are asking you to find just one cluster, it will have the lowest possible reconstruction error only if it chooses the biggest 
um, block here. So in the first iteration, it will choose the biggest blocks seen here. So it will uh, choose this block because only then it will have the lowest possible reconstruction error. Then what we would do is we would just remove these set of tracks from the input matrix, so which you can see here, and then you just feed it back into the algorithm again. So now it will choose the second largest PV and so on. So it'll keep doing this for K number of times. So the one advantage of this cadence approach or the basic FMTF approach is that this always prioritizes bigger PVs to smaller PVs. So um, in your particular workflow or the particular analysis you're doing, if, uh, if you just care about the bigger PVs and you don't care about the smaller PVs, this might be really helpful. Also, um, this was better able to detect PVs that had a low number of tracks but were well isolated compared to the basic FMTF. The one drawback compared to the basic FMTF was that um, the other one was able to better distinguish PVs that had a high number of tracks but were overlapping. So we wanted to come up with, a, with an implementation which combines the beneficial features of both um, KRUNS and the basic FMTF. And that is what we did next, which we call as KRUNS plus split. So in this case, we basically just extended the KRUNS implementation. So after the second step where we extract a particular block from the input matrix, we then feed this input matrix back into the basic FMTF implementation. And then we force it to find two clusters. And now we use a bunch of hyperparameters to determine whether um, basic FMTF has actually detected two PVs or not. And as usual, we then remove uh, the total number of blocks selected here, and then we repeat this for K number of times. So this is our final pipeline looks like. And in this final pipeline, um, we also added a stopping criteria so that the user doesn't have to specify the total number of um, PVs to find for, because obviously from experimental data, you wouldn't have that ground truth information. So it uses a stopping criteria to, uh, to try to automatically stop itself from iterating over and over. So as we'll see later on, this implementation was able to successfully combine the two beneficial features that uh, was noted earlier. So uh, the experiments, experimental setup. So the data we used uh, was 500 events that were randomly generated, generated using Pythia 8. And so the total number of PVs in all 500 events was around 3,906. The algorithms we chose to compare were our own K-runs plus split, k -runs, basic FNMTF, and also K-means and HAC, which are the algorithms you can find in the scikit-learn package in Python. So the metric we use for evaluation is that for a ground truth PV to be um, labeled as found, it has to be within um, 500 microns or 0.5 millimeters of a reconstructed PV. Also, only one reconstructed PV can find one ground truth PV. So for example, let's say uh, two ground truth, or let's say a reconstructed PV is in the middle of two ground truth PVs. So in this case, only one of those um, ground truth PVs could be labeled as found based on just this one reconstructed PV. And we ensure that the best possible match of ground root PVs and reconstructed PVs are made by the evaluation program by making use of the Hungarian algorithm. So, so before we go into performance, uh, let's also talk about one different plot which we uh, use for evaluating performance. The, uh, and we call this plot as performance by PV type. So basically what we did was we took all um, PVs in all the finite events and we identify three characteristics, namely the number of tracks in each PV, the variance of each PV, and also the distance to the closest PV. And based on, um, and so based on all these three characteristics, we labeled each PV as either low, medium, or high for all these three characteristics. And then we just took all the possible combinations of lows and highs to extract eight different scenarios, which encapsulate all the worst case or the extreme um, scenarios at which extreme scenarios of PV types you could find in the data set. So looking at the table at the right side, so looking at the symbols here, um, if, a sim sorry, if a symbol has a small circle compared to a bigger circle, it means that this one has a low number of PVs compared to this one. Oh, by the way, um, the plots at the right show you the um, density plot of the PV in question, which is in red, and uh, the nearest PV, which is in blue. Also, um, the dotted line was a thick line show that the dotted lines have PVs have a low variance, whereas uh, PVs with a thick line or a straight line have, sorry, I just confused that. Dotted lines show that uh, 
there is less distance between to the closest neighbor, whereas thick lines show that there is uh, more distance to the closest neighbor, as we can see between the first two entries, where here the two PVs are pretty much overlapping each other, showing that they have less distance between each other, whereas here there is, uh, they are well isolated and you can see the peak separately. Likewise, um, the difference between a circle and an ellipse shows their, their variance. So if something has a circle, it means they have low variance, whereas if something has an, has an ellipse, it, it means that particular PV has a high variance, which we can see by comparing entry number three and entry number one in this table. So going on to the final performance, we can see that out of the, um, out of the five algorithms we decided to compare, cadence plus split found the most number of ground truth PVs. So it found about 2,500 PVs out of the uh, total of 3,900 PVs. Um, also, one thing to note here is that except cadence plus split, all the other algorithms use ground truth data to choose the number of um, PVs you're searching for. So you can look from the table that, see from the table that um, all these four algorithms always found the exact number of PVs or clusters as the total number of ground truth PVs in the data set. Whereas cadence plus split found a much more higher number of clusters or PVs than um, the ground truth number of PVs. So though it found a 64% of all uh, ground truth PVs, we can also see that it has a very high false positive rate. And that is because it is finding a much more number of PVs than um, the total number of ground truth PVs in the data set. So this just shows that the stopping criteria we are using is not perfect or it's not good enough. So it is, uh, it is iterating for more number of times than it is supposed to. And looking at the percentage by PVs, percentage PVs found plot down below. So, um, so over here, um, when, if you first try comparing these two combinations here, um, this symbol here, LL, LLH and LHH, where these two combinations have PVs that are well isolated, but then they have a low number of tracks. You can see that k which has the orange bar, performs significantly better than the gray bar, which is the basic FMTF in both these scenarios. Also, looking at these two combinations at HLL and HHL, where the dotted lines show that um, the PVs are overlapping, but then the bigger circles show that there is a high number of tracks, you can see that um, the gray bar, which is basic FNMTF, performs much better than cadence, which is an orange in both these cases. And we can see that the blue bar, which is cadence plus split, um, was able to successfully combine the beneficial features of both cadence and FNMTF. So for future research directions and improvements, so the first thing we need to do is um, improve the stopping criteria that we are using because right now um, the algorithm is finding or reconstructing way more PVs than the actual number of ground truth PVs present in the data. Also, you could try to come up with a machine learning based approach to basically filter out tracks from tracks from the input data set. So before you perform clustering on, on tracks from a particular event, you could try to just filter out the important tracks from that particular event. So for example, if you think about plotting the density distribution of all tracks in an event, you would see multiple PVs in that. So you could try to find uh, an algorithm which chooses just the core tracks, which is around the peaks of all these, um, of all the peaks, rather than using all tracks. And we actually tried some experimentation with this, with ground truth information, and we saw some improvement while we used only these important tracks rather than using all tracks. Also, um, you could try to come up with a graph neural network based um, algorithm to replace the hyperparameters that are being used by um, cadence plus split. So, in the step where the, um, the output of k runs is fed into basic FNMTF and we use hyperparameters to determine whether um, it is actually finding two PVs or not, instead you could just use a graph neural network which would take in the whole block as input and it would just give you a label saying, okay, there are two uh, PVs merged or um, there is only one PV here. So this might help eliminate some bias that is introduced because of the hyperparameters. Also, once the algorithm is, has been um, sufficiently developed, um, the computational efficiency of our algorithm must be compared with um, other existing PV finding algorithms. So in conclusion, we studied the utility of um, matrix factorization for PV finding, and we also came up with our own um, variation of FNMTF for um, clustering and PV finding. So also based on our experimentation, we saw that our approach, our, our clustering approach perform better than some of the other clustering methods which we showed in the paper or which you showed in the presentation.
thank you for listening. Is there any questions? Any questions or comments? Sorry, go ahead, David. I'd one that may not be for you, but the, the input data, I, I guess it's also, the input data has been processed in either smeared or reconstructed in, in, in some way. Um, your, your slide suggests it's a generator level uh, data, but uh, I, I suspect it's not. Sorry, um, which, um, I don't I quite I, get it. This was on slide seven, but slide seven, Mike, okay. will probably, Mike will probably okay. answer my question. Sure, so this is the um, Toy Monte Carlo data that we've been using for PV Finder. And it's not fully reconstructed. It's got um, a proto tracking that's been run on it. So the, 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 the hits are include the, the detector effects and the tracking is a preliminary sort of proto tracking. It's not the full LHCB tracking. And so the resolution is a little bit worse and there are more ghosts. Okay, I was just wanting to confirm that there was some detector effects here. Uh, there's yeah. probably more it's detector the usual one, so. than in the real world. Yeah, okay, thanks. So Al, let me ask two quick questions. Did you simply use the track parameters that you, you got from the, uh, the, the, the prototype reconstruction or did you use the error estimates as well? And did you use the radial information or just the Z impact parameter information? Um, we just used the Z impact parameter information. And, okay, uh, so page 10, when you referred to using additional information, you, you've not incorporated this extra information to detect noisy tracks yet. Okay. Okay, just checking. Yeah. Okay, anyone else? No? Uh, thank you, Alan. It was uh, interesting work. Uh, thank you. Nice work this summer. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. So, all right. Thank you all for attending. And that's the uh, end of the presentations for today. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.